A lethal dose of radiation can creep up to 144 kilometers from ground zero. Um, no. Today we're going to be looking at second thought. Specifically, how many nukes would it take to eradicate humanity? For those of you who don't know me, I'm Tyler Foles. I'm a nuclear engineer with a little over 10 years of experience in the commercial nuclear power industry. I'm engineering operations to emergency response. I don't claim to know everything there is nuclear, but I can certainly share some knowledge. Let's check this one out. With all the recent political nonsense that's been going on, people are throwing the word Orwellian around more than usual. Orwellian. Whether or not those concerns are founded, there's been a lot of speculation regarding just what kind of horrible future the world is headed towards. Will we really- That's really sad. I kind of wish people were more optimistic about the future. They live in a dystopian society like George Orwell presented in his novel 1984. In my opinion, probably not. Okay. But where's the fun in that? With all the talk of Russian meddling in the recent U.S. presidential election, I should point out this video is about seven years old, so keep that in mind. Tension between nuclear powers is brewing. Now, the world has avoided nuclear war until now, but what if that were to change? How many nuclear bombs would it take to eradicate humanity? A lot. More than we currently have. Especially if you're talking about wiping out the entire population. The last time nuclear weapons were used in war was in 1945, on the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki at the end of World War II. These bombs, dubbed Fat Man and Little Boy, would be considered primitive by today's standards, and were actually two different types of bomb. Little Boy, the explosive that destroyed Hiroshima, was a uranium gun type bomb, which was detonated by firing one piece of subcritical material into another, triggering the nuclear reaction. Yeah, that's basically how it worked. It was a very simple device, but they were so confident it would work, they didn't even bother testing it, which is interesting. Fat Man was a plutonium implosion type bomb, which was triggered by essentially using smaller explosives to squeeze the bomb's plutonium core. Seems safe. Yep, it's essentially the same design, though it's a way more efficient design because you're essentially using three-dimensional space of surrounding the, for how you obtain your critical mass. Because that first design, it was just a cylindrical contact. Here's a spherical one, so you're fissioning all a lot more material when this bomb goes off. And it was mainly due to the bad geometry. Little Boy was less than 2% efficient, but the Fat Man was 17% efficient. Strictly talking about the fission core. Fat Man was actually a little higher if you count the natural uranium tamper undergoing fast fission. In terms of explosive power, Little Boy is estimated to have been between 12 and 18 kilotons of TNT, and Fat Man between 18 and 23 kilotons. That's about right. A kiloton is the measurement of the explosive power of 1,000 tons of TNT. By comparison, a modern nuclear warhead... And they are also used in other things for, in some cases, for conventional weapons, for tactical nuclear weapons, way on the megaton or gigaton end of the spectrum for things like volcanic eruptions can get pretty crazy. ...and have a yield exceeding one megaton, and modern hydrogen bombs, which I've lumped into the same category for this video, can exceed 3.8 megatons. No. The largest pure fission bomb was only 500 kilotons, and that... You're getting towards the end of your yield to mass ratio on that. And that was mainly just an impractical experiment. Let's build the biggest pure fission bomb, no fusion weapon we can. It might be possible to get to a megaton, but it would be so horribly inefficient. It's a lot easier to make a megaton of hydrogen bomb or fusion-based bomb. Which is 260 times more powerful than the explosive that destroyed Hiroshima. So you mentioned 3.8 megatons or higher. Um, on average? No, that is an average. That's way above average. Average is in the 400 to 800 kiloton range. There are some that are over a megaton, such as the B-83, but 3.8 is considerably above average. Even with their comparatively low yield, Little Boy and Fat Man wiped out between 113 and 226,000 people between them, with roughly half of those deaths occurring on the first day, with later deaths being caused by burns, radiation sickness, and other injuries. The reason for the big range is it's kind of hard to ascertain, and the reason for the big variation is how many were killed instantly, how many people died from burns afterward, collapsed buildings, and the targeted area. And let's just say that Hiroshima and Nagasaki wasn't exactly the best designed city in terms of fire protection, at least compared to modern fire safety standards. Just a lot of wooden structures that easily took fire. Uh, fire bombings of, in Japan 
killed similar numbers of people from that sort of thing. And, of course, radiation poisoning. But the numbers from that aren't as high at, weren't as high as the initial blasts or the fires. But that's one of the most horrible ways to go, so even a relatively small number from that is still quite horrific. If that kind of destructive power was packed into just two primitive nukes, what kind of scenario are we looking at today? For this thought experiment, we're going to consider the standard US B-83 nuclear bomb our baseline, with an explosive yield of 1.2 megatons. Hey, so they mentioned 1.2 megatons, so it's less than the 3.8 megatons <laughs> earlier. We're also going to give Japan a break and use my hometown of Dallas, Texas for ground zero to start the end of the world. Really? So, without further ado, let's blow up my neighborhood. The estimated fatalities from dropping a 1.2 megaton nuke smack dab in the middle of Okay, so he is using uh, Nuke Mac by Alex Wellerstein, which is a pretty good source. Dallas are estimated to be around 267,000, with another 649,000 injured. The initial fireball would have a radius of over a kilometer. Anything within that radius would be instantly vaporized. Moving further away from ground zero, the air blast radius would be roughly seven and a half kilometers. Sounds within right. this range, most residential buildings would be obliterated with considerable fatalities. Even further out, at the thermal radiation radius of 13.2 kilometers is where survival becomes slightly more possible. If thermal radiation, think anything within line of sights getting third degree burns. If you did manage to escape the worst of the blast, you'd still be covered head to toe in third degree burns. Yeah. But don't worry, you wouldn't feel it because these burns would extend through your layers of skin and destroy the nerves responsible for registering pain. It's horrific. You would still feel... True, you might not feel that individual burn, but you're... It's one of the most horrific, most burning is horrific and one of the most painful ways to go. Pain. Okay, so if we're looking at almost 300,000 dead on impact from one B-83 bomb, without taking radiation poisoning and other injuries into account, how many bombs would it take to wipe out the entire population of the massive Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex? As of 2016, DFW had a population of about 7.1 million people. Assuming each bomb killed 300,000 people, it would take 24 bombs to eradicate every single person at once. Of course, for whoever is nuking Dallas, that would be hugely wasteful. If the bad guys want- Hugely wasteful. I mean, sure. Because yeah, you're gonna disable a bunch of infrastructure and- To kill every human on the planet at once, it would take over a million bombs, which vastly exceeds the roughly 15,000 available. Yeah, it would take you over a million. To give you a sense of scale, all nuclear weapons combined in 1960 was about 23 million kilotons, or 23,000 megatons. And that's a bigger estimate than we have today. If you're talking about eliminating all life on Earth, the asteroid impact that killed the dinosaurs, which didn't end all life on Earth, didn't even end complex life, that was 10 to the 11th power kilotons. And of course, if you want to completely destroy the Earth, you're going to need about 6 times 10 to the 9th kilotons. That's Earth's gravitational binding energy. So, and just for fun, to destroy the Earth as quickly as, say, the Death Star blew up Alderaan, you're going to need 2.4 times 10 to the 25th power kilotons. As in, you're going to have to mine all of Earth, all of the asteroid belt, and probably several solar systems worth of uranium to get that much. If you want to see a deeper look into that, I'll uh, pin a comment down below. But it's not a terribly efficient way to cause the apocalypse. And even then, many of those aren't as powerful as B-83s. That's true. So they'd have to take a different approach. Instead of okay. simply aiming for the most fatalities at ground zero, the right tactic would be to take out infrastructure and agriculture. A recent scientific report suggests that 100 nuclear detonations in a fairly short period of time would produce 5 teragrams, or 5 billion kilograms, of soot that would clog the Earth's stratosphere. A lot of that depends on what you hit, but okay, let's take it at face value. ...and block sunlight, destroying much of the planet's ozone layer and triggering a drop in global temperature that could last over 25 years. Okay, um, this could be an example of the video's age and the age of that report, but it's staying up there for 25 years is highly debatable. There are other studies that show that it might not even stay up for 25 days, depending on how much soot it's released, how high it gets, because and some of it is just going to fall back down to Earth. So the whole nuclear winter, impact winter thing, highly overrated. I'll include that deep dive in the same pinned comment. But the short version is it's a range, not an on-off switch. And as far as 100 nuclear weapons, no. Even if there were simultaneous 100 megaton super SAR bombers that 
detonated in industrial areas, that's not eradicating humanity. Now, granted, it's going to dial back civilization in terms of just destroying a lot of infrastructure. But you have to remember, if you're looking at eradicating a species, even if it destroyed 99.99% of the population, that's still not enough. So even that combined with famine, I don't see how you're going to get even that high. Now, granted, nuclear war, don't take this as... I'm obviously not advocating for nuclear war or some crazy plan or anything like that, but species eradication, really hard to do because you're even going to have to get those communities that are off the grid in areas that aren't dependent on the infrastructure because, I mean, yeah, humanity as we know it would could be toast if you destroyed all infrastructure and 100 nukes isn't enough to do to destroy all of infrastructure, by the way. But there's always going to be those holdouts off the grid communities. And the title of the, this video is Eradicate Humanity, Not End Human Civilization. So even if they did end civilization, even if it was enough, that's still not eradicating humanity. This temperature drop, combined with the roughly 80% increase in UV radiation from the wrecked ozone layer, would destroy... 80% from eradicating of the ozone layer, no. So nuclear war, more likely to happen in the Northern Hemisphere. There have been studies, and again, that other video goes more into this, of about maybe a drop by 50% in just the Northern Hemisphere. But that's not enough to cause, which will make UV radiation worse, and you're going to have to limit how much time you spend outside more than you currently should be limiting yourselves. It's not going to cause catastrophic levels. I mean, the whole disruption of industrial supply, famines, yeah, those, those things will happen, but not enough to eradicate humanity. Destroy many land and sea-based ecosystems and spark a global famine. To kill sure. two birds with one nuclear stone, if we were to target 100 cultural hubs and industrial areas at once, that would knock out electricity, transportation, cultural hubs, art museums and opera houses and things like that. I don't think that would maximize damage. I mean, nothing against nothing against cultural centers, but in terms of like subsistence and survival, it's a uh, target, the means of producing electricity, food, water, things that we need to live first. Running water, food production, communication, and would cause the long-term global effects we just looked at. To make extra sure that the lethal effects of nuclear war are fully realized without going overboard, we can consider the average spread of radiation from our B-83 bombs. Okay, let's look. Over the course of a week, a lethal dose of radiation can creep up to 144 kilometers from ground zero. Um, no. Giving us an effective lethal range of about 65,869 square kilometers. So he's using nuke map, but he's not using the radiation function on nuke map. So I'm using the same nuke map he is. I put in 1200 kilotons targeting Dallas. And the thing about Fallout is this design is designed to produce an airburst effect. So a lot of the Fallout is just going to be blown away. And it's weather dependent. So I'm going to switch to surface. So you can see for a surface, the blast affects a much smaller area. By the way, the green zone is radiation at 500 rem, which is the LD5060 dose. That's 50% of the population dead within 60 days from high radiation. Though a lot of that's in the fireball and in the high blast damage, so that's going to kill people a lot faster. Looking at fallout is where things get interesting. And this is, so this direction is based on what direction the wind is blowing as of making this video. And here it is zoomed out, so it affects quite the region, though it does clear fairly quickly. This is a thousand rads per hour, which is almost guaranteed to be lethal if you absorb all that dose. This is why it is very important to stay inside a building if you happen to be downwind of a nuclear blast for at least 72 hours because this will decay rapidly but if you're downwind and this is about 24 kilometers per hour one hour after detonation if you absorb this dose that's going to be lethal this zone right here is 100 rads per hour if you absorb this for an hour to two hours you could get radiation sickness. It's not going to kill you, but it's going to be enough to cause nausea, vomiting, things of that nature. And here they are for 10 rads per hour and 1 rad per hour. Shouldn't affect you too much provided you don't 
skip around outside for 10 plus hours at the time with your tongue hanging out or anything too crazy like that. And the one red per hour zone, the biggest zone was about 40,000 square kilometers. The deadly zone was about 1,400 and the sick zone was about 8,500. So, however, that blast did less damage to actual city and infrastructure compared to the airburst. So I have no idea where he got this one. He didn't use the fallout fun for bomb. So if we take the total amount of land inhabited by humans, roughly 18.6 million kilometers, and divide that by our lethal range, you're looking at about 283 bombs. No. I mean, yeah, sure, he he put in those numbers into the fraction correctly, but that 65,000, even if we use the 18 million, that would put us at 18,000, assuming no overlapping fields of fire, and the wind blew exactly what direction that would be optimal, and the nukes were sequenced in some sort of magical dead hand type project to accommodate for the wind. So, no, we, we don't have enough nuclear weapons. And trying to kill by fallout is highly unreliable. If everything went according to our evil plan and we took out all the big cultural hubs around the world, that would mean that functional hospitals would be few and far between, and would often be unable to treat the victims of... Hospitals and cultural hubs. Maybe mean means something else by cultural hubs, just urban areas. If you're an urban planner or work in city development or anything like that, let me know about hospitals being placed in like cultural cities next to like museums and places and fine art centers and that sort of thing i don't there may be some correlation to that but it's kind of outside of my field of knowledge severe burns and radiation poisoning over the course of the two weeks following the attack millions if not billions would die from their injuries and in two weeks in two weeks some of that a lot of that soot is going to fall. Even the reports that are brought up in that other video say one to two years. Now, nah, if, if you're trying to do this with 100 nukes, they'd have to be super magical nukes. Via radiation poisoning. So, hypothetically speaking, it could feasibly take as few as 100 B-83 bombs to knock humanity into critically endangered status. No, it couldn't. To be thorough and basically ensure extinction would take around 300. Could isolated po- No, also wrong on that. Pockets of humanity survive this nuclear winter? Possibly. Okay. If they manage to avoid the So even if all that was at space value, pockets of humanity surviving, that still debunks eradicate humanity. Radiation at some remote Siberian outpost and had sustainable resources, they could feasibly save the species. Game of Thrones box set. Um, I'd only take seasons one through four. Things kind of went off the rails at that point. But then again, this video is a few years old. But it would take a long, long time to rebuild civilization as we know it. And there's your depressing speculation for the day. That is one that is one truth is with a hundred you could it could take a while to rebuild civilization as we know it, mainly because we know how little it takes to upset supply chains and international trade. It take that would take a lot fewer than one hundred nukes. So he's absolutely right about that. Go watch a cat video or something. Gotta love them cat videos. As always, this video was intended to spark your curiosity. Well, he got a few things right, but ultimately the premise on how many it takes to eradicate humanity. My answer is still somewhere in the ballpark of 10 to the 11th power kilotons worth, if you're talking full eradication. And even then, there's a chance we could survive the equivalent of an asteroid impact that killed the dinosaurs. We'd have better odds than the dinosaurs, just because I really appreciate all the questions on this topic, and thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time.